Hello, I'm Amanda Thomas, and you are listening to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of science events held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. In this episode, we hear a recording of a talk called An Animal's Guide to Dating Success by Dr. Allison Coffin, who is an associate professor of neuroscience at Washington State University, Vancouver. This talk was recorded a little while ago in November 2016, but I promise the information is still relevant and entertaining. Allie talks about a couple of different kinds of animals, mainly birds and fish, and some unusual strategies that they use to find and attract mates. There's no way to make a direct connection to how humans act, though you might recognize some of the behaviors that Allie describes. When Allie gave this talk, she had a slideshow with a lot of pictures, but there's not really an easy way for us to post the slides to be able to share them with you. She does a pretty good job of explaining what was on the screen, but I wanted to let you know that we've edited this recording a bit for clarity, and also that you might have to use your imagination a little bit. I will include some links to relevant images and sounds in the episode description. With that, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? All right, warmed up, ready to learn some interesting facts to impress or disgust somebody that you might be talking to at a party? All right, sounds good. How many of you have ever been on a date? Most, right? Okay. Now, how many of you have ever asked somebody on a date? Some? All right. So whether you've been on the asking end or the receiving end, you know that some asking works and some doesn't. And that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight. Essentially, how do some animals ask each other out? In this case, usually the males, and we'll be looking at that in a couple of different birds. What works? What doesn't? And particularly looking at bird behavior, I think you'll see some parallels between some of what birds do and some of what we do that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And then we'll move from birds into fish, which is my area of expertise, and look at some of the really crazy things that fish do, not so much in the asking part, because there usually isn't a lot of courtship with fish. They kind of get right down to it. So we'll look at some of the crazy mating things that they do, and hopefully that you've never even thought about experiencing. So starting out with something that might seem simple, many of us have been on the giving or receiving end of these, and that is the pickup line. <laughs> it's not just humans that use pickup lines, but... Also animals, a lot of males generally in the animal kingdom use a line or a song or a word or at least a signal to try to attract a mate. And we'll start with the easiest case and that is the whistle. So first to remind you what we sometimes hear, or at least some of us women occasionally. <whistles> right, that has sound gets heard at times. Now let's hear the bird versions. In this case, these are coming from two different species of flycatcher birds. This first one's gonna be really quick, so I may play it twice. Sounds a little like the human whistle, wolf whistle. Now let's try this flycatcher. that initially, just based on the physical appearance of some of these flycatchers, now here they look fairly different, they're in different lighting, different angles, but it was thought that they might be the same species until researchers realized that their calls, the male's calls, sound quite different. They sound somewhat different to us, but they have different features, and females only responded to one and not the other, and so it was the call of the male that really helps to distinguish these as two completely different species. So the whistle is one way that birds try to attract a mate, but for a lot of birds, the songbirds, it really comes down to more than just a simple whistle, but a much more complex song. But well, we can look at songbirds to really understand a lot about song features, and in particular, to know how songbirds learn song. And so for example, this is Gamble's white-crowned sparrow here. All right. 
right, so you can tell that sounded more complicated than those flycatcher whistles. This has what we call multiple syllables. Just like we think of syllables in human speech, birdsong also has syllables. And we can represent these visually. So if you use a microphone to record the birdsong and then represent it in this way, we're here now going across the bottom is time, so just time moving forward. And then here across the side is frequency in kilohertz. So lower frequency, bass, or closer to bass, is down at the bottom. Higher frequencies, the squeaky stuff, is up towards the top. And you can just see that we can see this visual representation of what the different syllables look like. So this is a syllable, this is a syllable, this one, and this one. And then there's a little bit at the end here. So you can see this is a fairly, you could call it a complex sentence, by these white-crowned sparrows. And one of the things that we've known for a long time is that sparrows and other songbirds learn their song. It's not that they're born knowing how to do this. The simple whistle of a flycatcher could be innate. They could be born with that capability. But the more complex songs of sparrows and canaries and other songbirds are learned. And they're learned usually from the male parent. And we can do these experiments in the lab by rearing male juvenile songbirds either in isolation or by listening to a sparrow tutor song. So playing the song and then seeing how well they can copy it. So in this case, here's the tutor song, and that has all of those different syllables I pointed out. And if the songbird's raised in isolation, so it never hears a tutor song, you can see it, gen it picks up some of the general features. We've got something down here that's a little bit lower frequency, kind of the same time. And then it gets a little bit higher frequency, a little higher pitch. Then we do this kind of woo down at the end. But it doesn't look like what we would expect a white crowned sparrow song to look like. So this is still a bird singing. It's like a child babbling to themselves as they're trying to figure out language. But without knowing what that language is supposed to sound like, they never really cement their song. That's what we call crystallization. That song becomes crystallized. It becomes very, very clear. Whereas if you raise a bird with a tutor song where they're hearing that regularly. Instead, it looks like this. So here we have our sparrow tutor up here again. And now here we have the bird song that's been learning that. And you can see they're not identical. There are bits of things here that look a little bit different. But the bottom line is they're very similar. So while each male sparrow is adapting its species dialect or species song and tweaking it a little bit overall, this is what we consider to be highly stereotyped, highly similar between these different songbirds. And we also know that the songbirds need to be able to hear themselves in order to learn to sing correctly. So if you deafen a juvenile male sparrow, he doesn't learn to sing properly. What's also interesting is that during the, so this is during the breeding season, they learn these songs and then they sing them to attract girls, attract female sparrows. But songbirds don't just sing during the breeding season. They sing year-round, but they don't sing as much when they're not breeding, because they're not trying to attract females. And the song doesn't sound the same. So in this case, I'm looking at during the breeding season, this is recording with a microphone from one sparrow, male sparrow, singing three different times. You can see each time things look really, really similar. These are just the names for the different syllables that he's producing. But if you look this direction, we have pretty much the same syllables every time. He's leaving off this little buzz part the last time. During the non-breeding season, one sparrow, three different recordings, they look really different. First of all, they're not as clean, but there's more variability. So the song gets really sloppy during the non-breeding season. And then the next breeding season again, we start to see this cleaner, more repetitive, more stereotyped song that sounds the same every time. It turns out that these changes are due in part to changes in the songbird's brain. During the breeding season, certain regions of their brains that are important for song production get really big. They have a ton of nerve cells in them. And at the end of the breeding season, about half of those nerve cells die, at least in those regions. At the start of the next breeding season, when testosterone is increasing in these birds and they're getting ready to breed, they replace all of those lost nerve cells. So we're now looking at seasonal oscillations in about 50% of their neurons, of their nerve cells, in these regions that are important for song production. And we can look at that here. So in this case, this is using a fluorescent microscope where all of the new cells are green. So in this case, 
These two cells, that used to be one cell that just divided, these are what we call daughter cells. So there are two cells that came from the same parent cell. In this case, now all the nerve cells are in red. This cell here with this arrow, this is a new cell that also is red, meaning that it's a nerve cell. So this is a new nerve cell that was born in the song production region of this sparrow. And in this case, these were sparrows that were given testosterone to get them into breeding condition. And again, if we just count the number of new nerve cells, and this was a study that was done by Elliot Brenowitz's lab at University of Washington, we can see that there are more new nerve cells in the brains of these breeding condition male sparrows. There's still new nerve cells going on in these non-breeding males as well. And more so than what we would find in, say, our brains, we continue to make new nerve cells throughout life, but in pretty limited numbers. So this is not only a nice way to think about song, but a nice way to also understand, or a good system to understand, how do complex vertebrate brains produce new nerve cells? And then how can we understand better how these cells are created, and then how they're used for learning, in this case, song, or in the case of humans, language? Because some of the same genes that help birds learn song, where if we mutate those genes, the males don't learn song as well, are also important for human language learning. And in humans with those mutations, there are serious deficits in language. So songbirds can really tell us a lot about their singing and about our own language. So in addition to the song, some birds get a bit extreme. And Amanda alluded to this earlier, and go past just song to all-out decorations. This is the male satin bowerbird. In certain light, he does appear a bit blue. The females are more of a drab brown. And these bowerbirds, these are found in Australia, and during the breeding season, they decorate their bowers with blue objects. Now, different species of bowerbirds prefer different colors of objects, but these guys, it's all about blue things. Now, blue things are pretty scarce in their environment, and as you can see, a lot of these objects are not natural. So they will use whatever blue objects they can find. And it turns out that blue objects are a pretty good indicator of male quality, meaning that they tell the female something about whether or not he might be a good mate. Because more experienced males and bigger males that are healthier tend to be able to accumulate more blue objects. They also store them between breeding seasons. And if a researcher goes in and steals half of their blue objects, the males will replace it in approximately the same number. So if a male had 20 blue objects before and you steal 10, he's going to go out and collect another 10. Whereas if you had a male that maybe only had eight before, he wasn't doing so well, and the researcher took half, meaning he had no chance with the females, he was only going to replace a few of those anyway. So that really tells us that there's something about this foraging that's going out and finding blue objects that means that males that are more fit mates, they're more vigorous, are better able to collect and steal and hoard these things. And they also steal them from the other smaller males that aren't as good at it. Now we'll take a better look at what these guys are really doing in there. And no, this will stay PG. So this one's more really about the courtship, which is what they're doing in the bowers. This is the female here inside the bower. The male has built this out of dry grass, has fastidiously decorated it with as many blue things as he can steal. And the courtship is elaborate. It starts with the females going around and checking out the bowers when the male isn't there. So this is checking out his house when he's not around to see if it's, he's interesting enough that she should come back and meet him. So I guess that's kind of like looking at his online profile, <laughs> determining whether or not he might be worth meeting. If she's interested, she'll come back when he's there, and then he has a chance to court her, and he'll do a song and dance. So it's not just about decoration, but it's also about his display, what kind of a show he puts on when the female is hanging out in the bower and the male is running around back and forth in front of her trying to impress her. And that looks like this. This is not nearly as musical as a songbird. If you're a female satin bowerbird, it sounds great. If you're a human, you wonder why they like this.
You got a good taste of his display? Are you impressed? All right, we have some that are interested in this bowerbird and some maybe that think she should look elsewhere. The female does a lot of subtle things to tell the male whether or not she's receptive, whether or not she's interested. Part of it is fluffing up her wings. So if she gets startled, if he's being too intense, if he's coming on a little too strong, she puffs up and gets all excited. And an experienced male at that point knows to back off. Whereas the inexperienced males don't know that and they tend to scare them away. <laughs> Sense any parallels here? I was out at a club a few weeks ago watching a fairly young man attempt to put some moves on a woman and he was absolutely clueless. And it reminded me a little bit of, say, a juvenile satin bowerbird trying the moves for the first time and her just fluffing up and looking at him in disgust. So she'll fluff if she's startled. And if she's receptive, she'll crouch down and stick her tail in the air. And that says, okay, maybe we can give this thing a try. And the males that pay attention to these different cues do better. So here, I'm only going to show you guys a few graphs, but I think these are pretty interesting. This is the startle rate. So how often she's fluffing up and showing that she's uncomfortable. This is courtship success. We have a nice negative relationship, which means the more she gets startled, the less likely he is to get lucky. This really means that the males need to pay attention. And that gets it here, male responsiveness. This was a measure of when she startled, how often did he back off on his display and not be as intense? And this is correlated with the startle rate. So the more responsive the male is, the less the female startles. Male pays attention, female doesn't startle as much, male gets to mate. It's also interesting because the young females tend to startle more easily. So this goes both ways here. It's not just the young males still figuring things out, but the young females as well. They really like blue objects and tend to be attracted to the males that have the most blue objects, but aren't such a big fan of the intense display because they get scared really easily. So to them, it's really about the initial appearance. What's this place look like? What can he buy her? Whereas with the more experienced males, or the more experienced females, they know that it's not just about the window dressing, and they really care what he has to offer. An intense display means that he's a vigorous, healthy male, and they have a higher tolerance for that kind of behavior. So the experienced males tend to get to mate with both the experienced and the inexperienced females because they can figure these things out. They can modulate their display so that she doesn't startle as much. The inexperienced males might get to aggressive and chase off the inexperienced females, and the inexperienced females are just looking at the blue stuff anyway. So it's this complex interplay that I think raises some similarities to some of our own behavior. And a lot of this was studied about a decade, more than a decade now, by a colleague of mine at University of Maryland, Gail Petroselli, and this is when she was a graduate student. She did some amazing work with RoboBird. This is a female robotic satin bowerbird. Yes, that's a real satin bowerbird skin. Yeah, a little gross, but it's on a post. Unfortunately, this was before really good remote wireless access. So Gail had to lay in the bushes in Australia about eight, 10 feet, 20 feet away from the robotic bowerbird and control it with a little controller. And it didn't do a lot of things, but it could fluff up a little bit and show that it was startled, or it could crouch down and show that it was receptive. And that's how we know a lot about the differences in male experience and age is because this robotic bowerbird could give these male signals and she could then observe how often the males picked up on those signals. So now that you've learned a little bit about birds and bird courtship and some of the potential parallels or maybe differences, now let's turn our attention to fish. And as I said, this is really more my area of interest with a background in fish biology. So we're going to look some at aquatic dating strategies. And this actually is more the exception rather than the norm, a lot of cases in the fish world of one male and one female. So now we're talking about group spawning. And this is really the simplest case in a lot of cases for fish where several males and several females will come together Certain time of year usually depends on water temperature, phase of the moon, seasonality, light phase. 
And they do what are called these spawning dashes, where at approximately the same time, and I don't know if it's entirely clear or how they know when to do this, everybody just rushes up to the surface and releases all their eggs and all their sperm in one big cloud. Does an egg need a sperm or not? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. You can actually see that cloud right here. So these guys are just coming back down after they've released all their eggs and sperm in just one big mass. But at the same time with a lot of fish, and these are fish that release, in the case of the males, a lot of sperm, and in the case of the females, rather than spending a lot of time making a couple of really big eggs, or not time, but energy, they spend their energy making a ton of really small eggs. They just release a bunch of eggs and a bunch of sperm, and these species reproduce just fine, so it's clearly a successful mating strategy. And this is one species of wrasse. These are species that are commonly found in coral reefs. Some of these species are also found off the west coast here, particularly in kelp forests. But some species of wrasse do things a little bit differently. And that's where we get into these harem mating strategies with one male and several females. And in this case, we're also starting to get into hermaphroditism, meaning sex change. And again, Amanda alluded to this earlier on with the clownfish. Wrasse do this in a slightly different way. So this is the bluehead wrasse. Here's the male here. And here is a female. And first of all, you can see that the bluehead, they clearly get their name from the, what are called these terminal males, which are the big dominant males. So a single male will have a harem of smaller females, and he defends a territory over several rocks or coral heads on a reef. But... He's also keeping the females in check. And by in check, I mean keeping them from becoming a male. And it's really not one and one, but as I said, there's a harem. So I just like that last picture because it's a little clearer. But here again, we have the male and his harem of females. And he can spawn with all of these females. But if he's removed, either if he's eaten or if he's removed by the researcher, the largest of the females will become a male, and she will take over the harem. So that's like having a group of girlfriends that's used to hanging out together and doing movie night, and suddenly one of them is now looking at the rest of those girlfriends very differently. <laughs> so that's the sex change going from female to male, where the females are smaller, they're expending energy in producing eggs, but they don't have a territory to defend, whereas the male is larger, is expending energy, defending a territory, and producing lots of sperm to mate with several females. And this is all external fertilization. So the male and the female release their gametes, their eggs and sperm into the water, and they mix. But it's usually one male with multiple females or just one female. In clownfish, things go in the other direction. So in this case, again, the smaller fish is the male, and the large fish on the anemone so you can see the sea anemone here. This bigger one is the female. And in this case, clownfish, once they find an anemone, so when they're really little, when they're larvae, when they're babies, they're just floating around in the water and they can disperse fairly long distances because they're just at the mercy of where the water is flowing. But once they grow up a little bigger and they pick up some cues from neighboring clownfish in an area, chemical cues that say, hey, this is a good place to to land to become bigger and metamorphose and to start to look and act more like what we would expect from a clownfish, they become males. So first they're juveniles, they're immature, but immature on their way to becoming males. They grow up into smaller males, and then the largest is the female. So in each anemone, you have one large female, one smaller mature male, and usually a few juveniles. And if the female is removed or dies, the largest male, that adult male, becomes a female, and the largest of the juveniles will become the adult male. So it's a hierarchy now of everybody maturing and really growing different sex organs, depending on who happens to be present. We don't know a lot about how this happens, but there are a few main things. We know that it's controlled by sex hormones, and these are the same kind of sex hormones that we have and that we think about, testosterone and estrogen. And in all vertebrates, including us, Testosterone can be converted to estrogen by an enzyme called aromatase. And this is probably the only big long word I'll throw at you guys today. And in the case of these bluehead wrasse, the male, not only is he mating with the females, but he's kind of harassing them a lot. And that stresses them out. So the stress then causes the female fish to make a lot of aromatase, 
which means that they don't have any testosterone. All their testosterone has been converted to estrogen. Estrogen, as we know, is the predominantly female hormone, so that means these fish stay female. If you remove the largest male, or if he gets eaten, suddenly they're not stressed anymore. But that also means that they stop producing as much aromatase. They then have more testosterone. The biggest one will start to act more aggressively towards the other females. She immediately starts stressing them out again. So while she's producing more testosterone and her ovaries are degenerating and she's forming testes, at the same time, she's stressing out the other smaller females so they can't do the same thing. And in that way, she turns into the large male, undergoes all these color changes as well. All of this is driven by testosterone. And the smaller females now stay female because they make aromatase again. In the case of clownfish, this is reversed. Because remember, now in clownfish, it's the smaller fish that are the males and the larger fish that are the females. So in this case, the big guys are defending the territory. And they need to be bigger, and that takes a lot of energy. Whereas in the case of the clownfish, they're hanging out on an anemone. They're not defending a territory. The anemone is giving them physical protection. So by the female being larger, she can put more energy into making eggs because eggs are more costly, to, energetically costly to make than sperm. Making eggs just takes more energy. They're bigger, they have yolk. That takes a lot of energy. And so here, normally, and it's actually not really known how aromatase is controlled in these guys, but the small fish then, the male, of course, is making testosterone and has very little aromatase. Whereas when that female is removed, aromatase gets turned on, testosterone gets converted to estrogen, and you wind up with a female. And exactly how that happens, we don't really know. Anybody confused yet? Male to female, female to male, eggs to sperm, ovaries to testes, and back and forth. All right, now let's look at something that's even slightly more confusing. And that is the mangrove killifish. These guys are simultaneous hermaphrodites, right? So sequential hermaphrodites go from male to female or female to male. Simultaneous hermaphrodites are both at once. And they're also one of only two known vertebrate species that can self-fertilize, meaning they pretty much just mate with themselves. So you wind up with clones. These fish live in Florida and in Belize and a lot of tropical areas, and they're found in mangrove swaps hence the name mangrove killifish. And each of them tends to inhabit a fairly small area. And it seems like each set of clones, meaning that each is identical to the parent that it came from because they reproduce by self-fertilization, seems to be pretty well adapted to that area, that small, say, area under a mangrove tree in which it's living. Although you can imagine that if that environment changes, they're not going to do very well to adapt to that change because there isn't a lot of genetic diversity here. They're all pretty much the same. And these fish have ovaries and testes at once. Looks like this, it's called an ovotestes. Here's the ovary and here's the testes right next to each other. So in this case, we're talking about internal fertilization that the sperm are produced in the testes and just have to migrate as far as the ovary. In fact, these hermaphrodites can't reproduce with each other because not that much energy goes into making sperm. Again, it takes a lot more energy to make eggs. So they only make enough sperm to be able to fertilize their own eggs, and they don't have a good mechanism for actually releasing the sperm out of the body. It stays right where it is, and there's just a connection to get to the ovary. So we really do just get self-fertilization. In the case of most of these killifish, it turns out that some populations of killifish do have males. So if you look in the Florida area, Florida mangrove swamps, you'll pretty much only find these hermaphrodites. If you look in certain areas of Belize, about 20% of the population is male. Some of that is genetic, but some of that has to do with temperature. So if you take all of these fish and rear them in the same environment in the lab, you get variable mixes of hermaphrodites and males. In this case, starting with an embryo, for the aficionados out there, no, this is not a killifish embryo. If you rear them at a fairly warm temperature, so 25 degrees C, so a warm room, you get a hermaphrodite. If you rear them at a colder temperature, you get what's called a primary male, meaning that it's not a hermaphrodite first, it simply becomes a male. There are no just females in this species. It's either hermaphrodite or male. Those seem to be the only options. 
If you take the hermaphrodite and you now raise the temperature to being a warm day, you get what's called a secondary male, meaning that it used to be a hermaphrodite and it has now, the ovaries have now regressed and it only has testes left. Now are you confused? Male to female, female to male, both at once, both at once to only one sex. So these are really complicated mating strategies. And it's thought that in part, this temperature regulation is again, at high temperatures or very low temperatures outside of their normal range, it takes a lot of energy for the fish to function and making sperm takes less energy. So these fish then forego making eggs in favor of just making sperm. And there are a few reports of the fish going back and forth between the two, but not very many. So in this case, these males, they can fertilize eggs in the hermaphrodites. They're only making sperm. They give more energy to making sperm, and they can introduce those sperm into the water. They can eject them from their body and fertilize eggs. But in the case, again, in the hermaphrodites, they don't make very many sperm. The sperm don't really have anywhere to go. They only fertilize the eggs internally. So we get a bit of genetic diversity from these guys, from these males, but it's mostly small populations of clones. So again, whatever you thought you knew about fish, that it has to breathe in the water, it has to stay in the water, they all have fins, we can find a fish that completely defies any definition of a fish. And then we can just find fish that do really weird things. So we've looked at these hermaphrodites, we've looked at some of the group spawning. Now what about the case of permanent attachment and the deep sea fish? You guys heard of these? This is a deep sea angler fish, this is the female, and this is the male. This is what they really look like. Right, so the female is about 60 times larger than the male. When the males are very small, they swim around freely and they have really big eyes and well-developed visual systems and really big nostrils and well-developed olfactory systems, smell systems. Because the females, this is in the deep sea, so it's dark, there aren't a lot of mates down there, but the females have a lure that bioluminesces, that glows, and that can flash, and the male with his big, well-developed eyes, kind of the whole wolf and red riding hood, why do you have big eyes, the better to see you with? In that case, that's true. He has really big eyes, the better to see a potential mate of his own species. And then the females also release pheromones, chemicals into the water that he can then smell, and he can follow the visual flashing and that olfactory trail, that smell trail, to find a female. And once he finds her, he attaches permanently. And his gut starts to degenerate, and his vascular system fuses with hers, and he truly becomes a parasite and will live as long as that female lives, but no longer. He can't detach and go find another female. So this really is mating for life in the most complete sense of the word. Some species have one male and one female. Some species can have six, seven, eight small males attached to one of those females. You can see that in the deep, dark ocean where it's really hard to find a mate, this is a pretty good strategy. You find one and you stick with it. <laughs> All right, one final story. In this case, about a species that I've worked on for the last several years. And these are the midshipmen fish, plain fin midshipmen. I happen to think it's attractive. Most of my friends tell me these are really ugly fish. They're local. So the plain fin midshipmen are found off the coast here in Puget Sound and along the west coast of the US. These yellow dots here, so here's the map. Obviously we're up here, here's California here, and we're here. And these yellow dots here represent where we find these plain fit and midshipmen fish. And they get their name because they have these photophores, these light emitting organs, along the underside, along their belly, that are thought to resemble the pattern of buttons on a naval midshipman's jacket. Hence the name midshipman. I've never actually compared them to see if that's really the case. These fish, again, as all the fish I've talked about, have some interesting mating strategies, and just interesting strategies in general for where they spend their time. During the winter, they head offshore, and we can find them in Puget Sound in about 60 to 100 meters of water, so about 300 feet of water, and we can collect them with a boat. So here I am holding the midshipman fish, and this is a boat not too far offshore, just north of Seattle. And what we do to collect these fish, because in the winter when they're not breeding, they burrow into sand 
at the bottom, and they have the eyes on the top of their head, so they can look around and see what's going on. But they're pretty sedentary. They don't do a lot of swimming. They mostly just hang out along the bottom. We can take a trawl, a big net, and drag it across the bottom and get these fish. Of course, we're not just going to get these midshipmen fish in that net. We get a lot of golf balls. Not quite sure. There's some pretty nice houses on the hill not too far from the collecting site, so I guess they're just practice driving ranges. We once got a large dead seal carcass. Not our fault. Clearly the seal had been there for a while. Although we did make the undergraduate, because he was the biggest, like lift the seal out of the net. We get some rockfish. We've gotten some little octopi and things like that. It's actually pretty cool. But we get several of these midshipmen fish. And then we can study their behavior. And in the summer, they're a lot easier to get and honestly a lot less expensive because in the summer they come near shore to spawn. And in this case, this is fairly close to Port Townsend. And here's Joseph Neros, one of my colleagues and I, collecting these midshipmen fish at low tide. The males build nests under rocks in oyster beds. And so they just, they swim under there and they kind of shimmy around and kick out some sand and just hollow out a nice little area under a rock. And then at night, the females swim in when the tide comes in and they find a male to mate with. But then the next morning when the tide goes out, the males and the females are left in these little sandy pools under rocks and we can just go up and lift up the rocks and look for the fish and just reach in with a gloved hand and grab the fish. So this is what one of these nests look like. Here's our little sandy pool. There's a fish there and a fish there and a fish there. These are the eggs on the underside of the rock. So they have sticky eggs and the female will actually flip upside down and lay the eggs on the underside of the rock and then the male will release the sperm and fertilize those eggs. This shows what the babies look like when they're attached to the rock. So you can see here's a little yolk and then here's a little fish and a little fish and a little fish. And again, just getting at weird things that fish do. Here's the female. Here's what we call the type one male or parental male. So he's the big guy that builds the nest and then he guards the eggs. And here, this little guy is the sneaker male. He waits until these two are busy and then he sticks his rear end into the nest, releases a bunch of sperm and swims off and lets this guy raise his young. The sneaker males look a lot like females until you cut one open. If you cut open, a, yeah, yes, I've done this. When you cut open a female, you find these big yellow yolky eggs during the breeding season. She's making eggs that are ready to be fertilized. When you cut open a sneaker male, you find testes, big ones, like 30% of their body weight. <laughs> right. These sneaker males are really built for making and releasing sperm. You can go to one nest, release some sperm, head to the next one, release some sperm, and just keep going. And they have no responsibility when it comes to raising the kids. <laughs> so how do they know where to go? And how do the females know where to go? And it's because of the song. The big males, the parental males, they build that nest, and then at night, they start singing. This is the environment during the day. And what they do is they vibrate their swim bladder, their gas organ, that also helps them stay Buoyant helps them regulate whether or not they sink or they float, but it vibrates like a balloon vibrating. And that creates a noise, it's called a hum, that attracts the females, and it sounds like this. That's it, not fancy like a bird. But if you're a female midshipman fish in the summer, that's a really attractive song. It's also interesting, has anybody heard of the Salsalito singing fish? Okay, so this was in Sausalito, California several years ago now, several decades ago. There was a houseboat community that was living with their boats all tied to a couple of docks. And at night, they heard, hmm. And they called the electric company to complain because it sounded like electrical noise. And the electric company said, we don't have anything out there. It's because they had put their houseboats right over nests of these fish. And every night, the males were singing. Because he'll sing or hum to attract a female. She'll lay her eggs. The next day she leaves, the next night he hums again, tries to attract an additional female, because once he's guarding that nest, he can have eggs from a bunch of different females in the same nest and guard them all. And in this case, it's the male, the parental male, doing all the work. The females left, and the sneaker male was really only in it for a fraction anyway. We know that the females are really attracted to the male song. 
We don't know what it is about that song, but I'm gonna show you a fairly grainy video, and this was taken at Bodega Marine Lab in California years ago, where we have a big cement tank, and in the center we put a speaker, and in that speaker we can play different sounds. We can either play the hmm, or we can play a grunt noise. These fish also make grunts and growls, as they're called, which is when they're pissed off at each other. And we can then take a female that we picked up from a nest, who has not yet spawned, put her in the tank and watch her behavior and see if she's really interested in that male song. So watch this. We're gonna need to hit the lights for this one. Here's the speaker at the center. It's got a little net over it. We're trying to camouflage it fairly poorly. And you'll see the fish, the female fish swim in. She's swimming from the outside of the tank, from the edges, right when we start playing the song. Oh, and there she went. So this is the female. I'll try to help you follow her. And this is playing that male's hum. And she's right up on the speaker trying to figure out where he is. And then in a moment, this will stop. And she won't be as interested anymore. OK, so it stops. She's still looking around a little. Now she's hanging out. But she's not back up on the speaker. Oh. That's the growl. That's not a happy midshipman call. All right, this goes on for several minutes here, but you get the idea that when the hum is played, a female that's in breeding condition, that's ready to reproduce, she's right there trying to find the male, whereas she's not as interested in some of these other sounds. And as soon as she's done breeding, she's not as interested anymore. That makes sense. But it's not just that she's in breeding condition or not. Some of the research that we've done in recent years shows that she's also better able to hear the male during the breeding season. So it's not just what he has to say, but that she can hear what he's saying at all. So here now we're looking at frequency across the bottom, so bass to still pretty much bass. These fish don't hear very high noises, very high pitches. And hearing threshold here, meaning the higher the number, the louder the sound has to be for them to hear it. This is what a fish ear looks like. This is using an electrode stuck in the fish's ear, playing a sound to it, and then recording the electrical activity, the nerve impulses, that tell us whether or not this sound caused the ear to respond, whether or not the ear could detect this sound. And in the winter, when these fish aren't breeding, they don't hear very well. And these are females. In the summer, when they are breeding, they hear significantly better. It's not a huge difference. They still don't hear nearly as well as we do. But their hearing gets better seasonally. And we can drive this with estrogen. So if you take a winter female and we implant her with estrogen, about three weeks later, her hearing improves. So why is this? That's been some of the work that I've been focused on in recent years. And I'll just leave you with one taste of what's going on there in my own work. And that's looking at the ears of these fish. So I showed you here, we have the ear. And this is if you're just looking into the fish, so we've removed part of the skull, and the brain is right here, and the ear is right here. So first of all, the ear is almost as big as the brain. And you don't, fish don't have external ears. You can't see them, of course, on the outside of the fish. They don't stick out and hold up their glasses. But they have these internal ears right alongside the brain. And then we can look at smaller parts of those ears and really ask what's going on with their cells inside their ears. What you're seeing here, this structure here, is the hearing part of the fish's ear. So this was dissected out of the fish, and then we use fluorescent dyes to be able to see the different kinds of cells, where each of these green dots here corresponds to each of these green dots here. Each of these is the top of a single hair cell. These aren't hair cells like on the top of our heads, but we have hair cells in our ears as well that allow us to hear. Fish have these in their ears that allow them to hear as well. All vertebrates do. So what we asked is, if these females can hear better during the breeding season, is that because they have more hearing cells, more hair cells in their ears? So we counted them. And it turns out that they do. So here is just the number of these sensory hair cells, these hearing cells. And in the breeding fish, they have more of them. And again, if you take a non-breeding fish, implant her with estrogen, a few weeks later, she looks like this. So in this case, estrogens are leading to these cells dividing into growing new hair cells. So we now have changes in new nerve cells being produced in bird brains due to hormones, 
and hormones also driving the addition of new hearing cells, new hair cells, in the ears of these fish. And these aren't things that we do very well at all, so it's not just important for understanding fish, but by looking at this, we can understand more about how we could maybe create more of these hearing cells in us. But the bottom line really is this may be part of what's helping her better hear that male so that she can find him and then mate with him. We're not exactly sure if those sneaker males do this as well. If you think about it, the sneaker males need to be able to find the big male, right? They listen to him saying, head into the nest and sneak out again. The problem is the sneaker males are so sneaky, we don't know where they are in the non-breeding season. We just don't find them. So we can't really find out what's going on with their ears. So in conclusion then, given you just a few tastes of these things, we've talked about some f birds, we've talked about some fish. This goes anywhere from a whistle to a song to a dance to a sex change and everything in between. I hope you've learned a little bit about some of the ways that animals date and mate. And I hope you're a little more appreciative that we might have it easier than we think. <laughs> Thanks a lot and I'll take questions. Thanks for listening. This podcast and Science on Tap are created by Via Productions. We're based in Portland, Oregon in the U.S. If you want to find out more about how to go to one of our events, check out our website at scienceontaporwa.org. And that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at scienceontaporwa. I'd like to say a couple of thank yous for the use of the bird sound recordings. First, the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology generously gave us permission to use the bird calls for the flycatchers and the white-crowned sparrow. Second, Dr. Gail Patricelli from UC Davis enthusiastically agreed to let us use the sound of the excited bower bird. There are links to each of the recordings and the robo-bird video in the episode description. Next, I want to mention that Ali is also the president of an organization called Science Talk that helps people communicate about science more clearly. If you are a scientist or someone who talks about science, please visit sciencetalk.org. I'd also like to say a big thank you to my volunteers who have been helping me run events for a long time. None of this would happen without them. They are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Steve Perry, along with many other people. I'd also like to say a special thanks to Amber Peoples for coming in and for running things for the past few months. Finally, thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. Just a